When I get older, losing my hair, many years from now, will you still be sending me a valentine? Birthday greetings, bottle of wine. If I'd been out till quarter to three, would you lock the door? Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? When I was a kid, my parents would go away on Pesach, leaving my brothers and me in the care of my Bubby, our grandmother. Bubby was a tiny little European woman with a bun of gray hair who cooked Russian cabbage borscht and krepelach and mountains of latkes. Years later, I calculated her age. She was 55. <laughs> but, but she was old. <laughs> In 1900, life expectancy in America was 47 years. It rose to 63 in 1933, which is why Social Security was pegged at 65. The concept of retirement was proposed by physician William Osler in his 1905 valedictory address to the Johns Hopkins Medical School as a way of getting older workers out of the way of more productive younger workers. In 1920s, retirement communities for the wealthy began popping up in Florida. By 1960, the lifespan expanded to 66 for men, 73 for women, and the concept of retirement for everyone took hold. Retirement was seen as a time of rest, relaxation, a second childhood of play and recreation, far away from the cares and stresses of the working world. In 1960, Sun City, Arizona opened. In 1962, Leisure World in Orange County. Today, if you live to be 65, your life expectancy is 87. My Bubby at 55 would be considered entering midlife today. The average age of admission to the Jewish home for the aged in Reseda is 89, and last year Hallmark sold 85,000 happy 100th birthday cards. Today, there are 56 million Americans aged 65 or older, that's 17% of the population, up from 12% in 2000. The population of Americans over 65 is the fastest growing cohort of the American demographic, growing five times faster than the general population. In 2050, it's projected to be 88 million. This will have a profound effect on social policy, on economics, on healthcare, on culture, and on family life, but more. It has profound implications of how we think about our lives. If a third to half of our adult lives is lived after 65, what is the meaning of retirement? This time of life is no longer a postscript, an afterthought. It's now a significant portion of our lives. We have been given a precious, precious gift. The old Jewish blessing was, may you live to be 120. Those of us lucky enough to enjoy relatively good health, cognitive ability, and some degree of financial security might actually get pretty close to that. But with that gift comes a challenge. When I was a teenager, I knew exactly what was expected of me. I knew how to dress, how to talk, what music to listen to, what radio stations to tune into, where to hang out. The culture gave me a map. When I was a young adult, Entering the working world and beginning a family, I knew what was expected. I had a map for that. When I reached my maturity, again, the culture provided a guide to life. It provided a map. There's no map for late adulthood, the years from the end of work until old age. We have no concept of what these years are for. The truth is that American culture is afraid of old age. We identify growing older with personal diminishment and decline. Everything that's good in America is new and improved and young. Youth means vitality, 
Youth means energy, creativity, imagination. Ever see any product, any product advertised, guaranteed to make you look older in minutes a day? <laughs> We're supposed to look younger, feel younger, think younger, be younger. It's no wonder that the culture hasn't got a clue what to do after age 65. But this isn't just about old people. Wherever you are in your life, this is about you. This extended longev longevity changes our whole picture of adult life. It alters the map all of us are holding. American culture taught us that adulthood is measured in terms of productivity. Adulthood means making a living, building a family, pursuing success. That's normative adulthood in America. Everything that comes before is preparation. So we went to school to prepare for a career, to ready ourselves to earn success. And everything that comes after, after our productive years, is an afterthought, an epilogue. Older folks are unproductive, just like children. So they're treated like children, sent away to spend their days in play. Hence, leisure world. Normative adulthood is the story of productivity, about what you do. Two people meet for the first time at a party or on an airplane. After what's your name and where are you from, the next question is, what do you do? I'm a doctor. I'm a lawyer. I'm an accountant. I'm a stay-at-home parent. I'm in business. The answer locates you on a social grid, assigns you a rank, describes your identity. You are what you do. But what happens, what happens to identity when you're no longer doing that work? Who are you? And if productivity is no longer the measure of personal success, no longer the goal, what is? It's no wonder that people have psychological crises and even some health crises around retirement. If I'm not what I do, then what am I? Or worse, am I at all? Wrote Abraham Joshua Heschel, the great Jewish philosopher, quote, in terms of manpower, the aging person is a liability, a burden, a drain on our resources. According to, all, to the standards we employ, the aged person is condemned as inferior conditioned to operating as a machine for making and spending money with all other relationships dependent upon its efficiency. The moment the machine is out of order and beyond repair, one begins to feel like a ghost without a sense of reality. Regarding himself as a person who has outlived his usefulness, he feels as if he has to apologize for being alive. Concludes Heschel, may I suggest that our potential for change and growth is much greater than we're willing to admit, and that old age be regarded not as the age of stagnation, but as the age of opportunity for inner growth. Most of us are going to finish working long before we grow old. That's a real blessing. But if work is no longer the defining characteristic of adulthood, and the pursuit of success no longer the driving preoccupation of adult life, we must redefine what adulthood is. We must redraw the entire map of the lifespan, and you can't wait till you're 65 to figure it out. Once upon a time, there was a man named Abraham. Abraham lived a comfortable, secure, prosperous life in a town called Haran. He inherited his dad's business, married his beautiful cousin, and except for her infertility, he lived a perfect life. And then God comes and commands him to leave home, start a new life in a far-off place as God's advocate for justice and righteousness. Abraham was 75 years old when God called. Moses lived a comfortable life, tending his father-in-law's sheep in the desert of Midian. 
One day he stumbled across a burning bush, and out of the bush came the voice of God, commanding him to return to his childhood home in Egypt and free the Israelite people. Moses was 80 when God called him. Serach bat Asher was the youngest daughter of Asher, Jacob's 11th son. In the Torah, her name occurs in the list of the family that went down into Egypt with Jacob. And then in another list, among those who left Egypt with Moses four generations later, tradition taught she was the only one of us who experienced the whole drama of Israel's enslavement and liberation. God seems to really like old folks. <laughs> or rather, the Bible understood that adulthood comes in stages. A first stage and a second stage. First adulthood, first stage, is indeed about productivity. The Talmud in Pirkei Avot describes this. At 18, one is ready for marriage. At 20, one begins a career. At 30, one is at the height of his or her powers. First adulthood is about building. Building a career, a family, a community, but most importantly, building a self establishing an identity. In the first adulthood, we seek significance. We need to know that we are special, that we matter. The ethic of first adulthood is winning, conquering. We build a resume of accomplishments, a portfolio of achievement, and we are rewarded with recognition, applause, and approval. In this time of our lives, we possess what the psychologists called fluid intelligence. We possess raw smarts. We're good at reasoning, thinking abstractly, devising strategies, and solving problems without relying on previous learning or experience. Fluid intelligence peaks in our 20s and 30s. And that's why mathematicians and physicists make their greatest discoveries in their youth. Newton was invented calculus at 24. Einstein was 26 when he conceived of relativity. According to the Harvard Business Review, the founders of enterprises backed with $1 billion or more in venture capital cluster in the age range of 20 to 34. Then, beginning in our 30s, our powers of fluid intelligence begin to decline. And they decline even more rapidly after 40. It's pretty depressing. However, however, Something else happens. What the psychologists call crystallized intelligence emerges in midlife and grows gradually through our later years. Crystallized intelligence is the ability to organize and synthesize the store of knowledge, skill, and experience gained over a lifetime. To articulate it and to share it, teaching rather than innovation is the fruit of crystallized intelligence. In other words, human evolution has prepared us to be clever in our early years and wise in our later years. The Talmud scheme of life continues. At 40, one achieves understanding. At 50, one is prepared to give wise counsel. At 60, one is given the deference of seniority. At 70, one is called a sage, and at 80, is the strength, is the, is the age of heroic strength. Joseph was an egocentric brat, so arrogant that his brothers sold him into slavery in Egypt when he was 17. Through his gifts, he rose to become second only to Pharaoh in ruling Egypt. Joseph controlled all the world's food supply. People from all over the world came and bowed to him. And then in his 40th year, his brothers showed up. They showed up in front of him, and his world was overturned. He feels a deep longing he's never known. So the mighty Joseph came down from the throne, took off the mask of power, and in tears embraced his brothers. Ani Yosef Achicha Od Avichai, I am your brother Joseph. Does our father still live? Power glory, position, wealth, fame. Joseph had all the rewards of first adulthood. He won. 
All his dreams came true. And then comes that moment when everything is overturned. A career comes to an end, an unexpected dangerous diagnosis, a friend dies suddenly, a child gets in trouble, a marriage turns rocky, a failure, a loss, a crisis, a disappointment, and all of our plans and all of our dreams are upturned. It takes a long, long time to heal. But as we do, something changes in us. Life is not about winning anymore. What's important now is connecting. Power no longer satisfies. We crave intimacy, closeness, empathy. According to the Harvard study of adult development, the best single best predictor of physical health and psychological wellness in old age is not wealth or fame, education level, not even genetics. It's the quality of your relationships. Who you love and care for at age 50 makes all the difference at age 80. When God, when he met God at the burning bush and was commanded to return to Egypt, Moses complained, Lo ish dvarim anochi. I am not a man of words. I have no words. Forty years later, something had changed in him. Deuteronomy, the Torah's last book, begins with the words, Moshe. These are all the words that Moses spoke to the people of Israel on the banks of the Jordan. And he goes on talking for 34 chapters. Moses found words. He knew that he would not accompany his people into the promised land, so he would send his words into the land through the hearts of his people. Moses very well could have retired to a very comfortable private life, the leisure world, reminiscing about the adventures and accomplishments of his past, or he could have brooded on his failures and his disappointments, most especially God's unwillingness to allow him to enter the land and enjoy its promise. Instead, he turned away from his past and faced the future and chose to become Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses our teacher. The psychologist Eric Erickson calls this generativity, locating one's value in mentoring, guiding, and teaching the next generation. Generativity offers immortality, not for the self, not for the ego, but for the values and ideals and truths we stand for and fight for. Generativity recognizes that we live in a social world, family, community, humanity, and bear a responsibility to leave it better than we found it. Generativity faces forward, not backwards. It is a commitment to the future, even if it's a future we won't see. And in that way, it is a profound declaration of hope. When Moses was ready to take us out of Egypt, he remembered a promise made generations earlier by his ancestors to bring the bones of Joseph back to Canaan, back to the cave of the patriarchs and the matriarchs in Hebron. But the passing years had concealed Joseph's burial place. According to the Midrash, it was the old wise one, Serach bat Asher, Serach, the daughter of Asher, who came forward and revealed the secret of the hidden tomb of Joseph to Moses and his people. In a culture that reveres innovation and values only the, the new, this may be hard to hear, but there are things you only understand when you get older. Things you can only appreciate when you've seen a bit of life. The past has left us secrets and only those of us with some experience can help find them. Age doesn't automatically bring wisdom, but it offers perspective. It reminds us that things weren't always this way, and therefore what is, isn't inevitably what must be. We are not bound to the past, but neither are we enslaved to the present. Serach Bat Asher was a keeper of meaning, who saw her role in gifting the next generation the treasures of the past writes Dr. George Valiant, head of that Harvard study, if the task of young adults is to create biological heirs, 
The task of old age is to create social heirs. Only the old can make the past come alive for the next generation. Why did God wait until age 75 to launch Abraham on his journey? Because it takes until we're well into life to realize the deepest of all personal truths. It's not about me. The meaning, the happiness I seek in my life will not come from climbing the next rung of achievement or the next accolade or the next milestone of success. That's first adulthood thinking. By second adulthood, we know better. We know that whatever level of success we reach, however much recognition and approval and applause we receive, it will never be enough. It's never enough. The need can never be quenched. Meaning and happiness do not come from placating the ego, from, but only, only from surrendering the self to something beyond the self in dedication, in sacrifice, in devotion, in commitment. Taught Shner Zalman, the first Chabad rabbi, there comes a moment in the life of every person of faith when we can find no more meaning. We can find no faith. We can see no order to the world. What do you do, he asked. What does a person of faith do? Go out and do one selfless act of goodness. Feed one hungry soul. Teach one child. Protect one vulnerable. And then you'll feel in your own hands and your own fingers, and your own self, the presence of God. Taught Abraham Joshua Heschel, the glory of human life is to be needed. At the end of the spiritual search, we do not find a God who validates us, but a God who needs us. God's first words to human beings, according to the Torah, formed a question, where are you? Religion, Heschel taught, religion begins with a consciousness that something is asked of us. It is in a sense of indebtedness, knowing that I'm needed, that God seeks me as a partner, a vessel for the divine dream that I locate my significance, my purpose, my meaning, and my happiness. Relationship, generativity, indebtedness are the elements, the foundations of a meaningful adulthood at any age. Together, they have a quality of transcendence, moving us beyond the narrow self, beyond the present moment, beyond the endless need for more. They open a world of care and love and commitment. This is the way to happiness at any age. This is what second adulthood comes to teach us. And this is what all of us are going to have to learn if we're going to enjoy this precious, precious gift of long, long years. When Paul McCartney was 13, his mother died of breast cancer. A year later, he wrote this song for his father a child's memory of his parents' love, a song, a tribute to the old age they never got to see together. He recorded it the year his father turned 64. Today, McCartney is 81 and still making music. Send me a postcard, drop me a line, Stating point of view, indicate precisely what you mean to say. You're sincerely wasting away. Give me your answer, fill in a form, mine forevermore. Will you still need me? Will you still need feed me?